Welcome to Taiwan Talks, I'm Brath Wang. Deutsche Welle, Germany's public state-owned broadcaster, published an article in February called Is Philippines Marcos Jr. the EU's New Best Friend? As Europe looks for more partners in Asia, including strengthening ties with Taiwan, we look at what this means for the region. Joining us today are Max Lin, Donghai University Associate Professor of Political Science specializing in international and European relations, Marcin Yajewski, European Value Center for Security Policy, Taiwan Office Head. A very warm welcome to both on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Many European analysts have taken note of Philippine President Marcos Jr.'s pivot away from Duterte's China-friendly approach to becoming closer allied with the U.S. We've even seen European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen visit Manila last summer. She was the first sitting president to visit the country. Professor Lin, what is behind Europe's pivot to the Philippines? Okay, obviously for 21 century, Asia has become the most growth-fast economic area in the world. Therefore, the EU need a new strategy toward Asia. That's basically the first idea. And also, the EU also changed their attitude toward China. And uh, mainly because the issue in Hong Kong, COVID-19, Ukraine war, all these issues all made the EU has to change their chi Chinese policy. And uh, according to the best friend, I mean for the EU is American. American, Japan, Australia, India, they already have Indo-Pacific strategy. So under the members, France, Germany, and uh, Holland, they all have Indo-Pacific strategy, so the EU also adopt the Indo-Pacific strategy and the main target is exclude China from Asia area. So they need more friends in this area in Indo-Pacific. So Philippines is not reason behind this whole issue. Speaking of the change in attitudes, and we brought up China, we brought up the Philippines, Taiwan is neighbors of both of them. So. What does that mean for Taiwan, Marcin? I believe that Max has already uh, outlined the importance of the Indo-Pacific strategy for the overall policy-making process for the common foreign and security policy of uh, the European Union. But I think that one lesson that Taiwan can really draw from the new pivot towards Manila in the European Union is the domestic political change that we see in the Philippines. The election of President Marcos Jr. in 2022 has ushered in a new era of a foreign policy in the Philippines, which once again becomes more internationalist and more pro-Western. Human rights violations uh, carried out by the previous administration of President Duterte have uh, raised alarm in the European Union. We have to remember that when European Union pursues external action, it acts as a so-called normative power. It means that it seeks to project its power through normative means. Which is different from the US. I believe that uh, there is a strong normative component to American foreign policy as well. So I don't think that the concept of normative power is exclusive to European foreign policy making, but human rights are at the core of external action of the European Union, including its, bu its business dealings. So uh, even looking from the perspective of economic policy, we have seen a shift in attitudes that the EU has towards the Philippines. and. Once the issue of human rights has been partially resolved under the Marcos administration, the EU became willing to reopen FTA negotiations with the Philippines. So once again, the lesson for Taiwan here is that normative uh, appeal matters for strengthening ties with the European Union. Speaking of Taiwan, the government has been promoting the new southbound policy where the Philippines is one of the target countries. Some analysts have said this closely aligns with the EU's IP strategy around global connectivity. Marcin, Back to you again. Can you compare the two? Absolutely. The two foreign policy documents, the new southbound policy and then the global gateway strategy, which is essentially the connectivity 2.0 strategy of the European Union, share some similarities in the sense that they uh, both seek to promote sustainable um, in, uh, initiatives which are uh, related to uh, bolstering economic and people-to-people -people ties. The newness in the new southbound policy uh, promulgated by the Thai administration in 2016 is precisely that uh, people-to-people -people dimension. So one of the four pillars of the 
um, New South One policy focuses on um, talent exchange, uh, for example. So in many ways, there are complementarities between the New South One policy and the Global Gateway Strategy in the sense that they try to enhance uh, development in Southeast Asia through uh, investments which are of quality, which are sustainable environmentally, socially and uh, economically. And this is uh, not a new idea in the context of Taiwan-EU relations. The European Parliament in its September 2022 resolution has explicitly called on the European External Action Service and the European Commission to uh, co-invest in projects under the aegis of Global Gateway and the New South Bank policy. Europe is gearing up for its own elections. Uh, we will have European Parliament elections between June 6th and June 9th. And I think that a crucial task for the new, uh, probably also geopolitically geopolit oriented uh, European Commission will be to explore these uh, synergies further. As a European expert, Professor Lin, do you feel, is there any area that Taiwan can learn from Europe as what Marcin mentioned in terms of strengthening ties with our neighbors, especially with the Philippines, given how close they are? Mainly, our southbound policy is try to de-risk with China. And uh, the EU, they think big, much bigger, because their power, their role is much more. And uh, when we talk about our southbound policy, we look at not just Southeast Asia, but including South India. For example, India, Pakistan, and also Australia, New Zealand. Which so India is also boosting ties with the Philippines yes, at the yes. same time. So, th of course, we need to learn the value, of, as you mentioned, the normative power. Although Taiwan, we are small, but also we share the democracy, we share the value and the, our technology. So, mainly when we to engage with Southeast Asia, we cannot only try to use their country or their cheap labor. We need to think how do we create the job opportunity in there and transform our not just value but also technology to this Southeast Asia country. They need Taiwan's technology, not just you know their cheap labor cost. It's interesting you mentioned technology and economics. And President Marcus Jr. visited Germany earlier in the year. And as Marcin mentioned earlier, there have been more talks with European countries on free trade agreements. And there's a lot of hope that it could be passed before his term ends. Um, we've also seen Manila cancel key Chinese Belt and Road initiative, um, such as infrastructure projects. Some had said that this European investment can actually fill in that void. What do you think, Professor? And I'll also go to Marcin in a bit. OK. Actually, so far, the Philippine top trade partner still China, and then go for Japan, the United States, and then the EU. So. And for the EU, it's try difficult to fill this void. And actually, now so far, it's Japan, South Korea, and India try to fund this railway project. But still, the EU already signed a lot of trade agreement and a secu security cooperation with Philippines. So you see, the markets, they see the opportunity. They cannot only rely on American, especially American, sometimes they are quite internal, so they need s alternative, and uh, the best f choice should be the EU. But still with like-minded allies, as you mentioned, the EU shares democracy and all that. Yes, and yes. And Marcin, what do you think? I believe that the free trade agreement between the EU and the Philippines will be a crucial document laying a foundation for closer economic exchanges between both sides. In, and it could also facilitate boosting investment ties and FDI flows from the European Union to the Philippines. The three main areas where the EU and the Philippines could bolster their collaboration include trade, development and maritime security. As a normative power, the European Union has a special role to emphasize also non-military dimensions of protecting uh, maritime security and also uh, building understanding and capacity of Philippine stakeholders uh, between the topics of maritime security and sustainability. For example, one dimension of uh, safeguarding maritime security is um, the aspect of protecting uh, marine ecosystems. So. This is all to say that investments are extremely important and the announcement of resumptions of FTA talks and also the sustainability impact assessment which the European Union carried out 
in the process of negotiating the FTA, these are um, all very important. But what the European Union can do is not only provide hard infrastructure, but also soft infrastructure in the form of uh, capacity building. In a way, this is reminiscent of Taiwan's own model of being a developmental actor. Taiwan has a very long-standing history of being an active player in Southeast Asia in terms of soft infrastructure and technical assistance provision, having started uh, similar initiatives as early as 1952, when Taiwan itself was a major recipient of uh, USAID assistance. So this is where I see a lot of space, not just for the European Union, but perhaps even the European Union to join like-minded partners in the, in the Pacific, like Taiwan, like Japan, like South Korea, to complement those investments, to complement hard infrastructure developments with technical assistance and soft infrastructure. So would this come in, say, like um, support for agricultural assistance, as in bettering farming techniques and all that? Uh, for example, this is, this is one tool that could be deployed. The um, European Union also operates the TIEX uh, initiative, which is a technical assistance and information exchange platform. Taiwan has benefited from TIEX initiatives itself, particularly in the domain of sustainable fishing. And this is, this is precisely the type of tool that is already being deployed in the Philippines and can be scaled up as the partnership continues to develop. I wanted to go back to a point you mentioned that was key to what the Philippines is concerned on, which is maritime security. We've seen EU warships more frequently sail across the Taiwan Strait recently. Eleven European states have also issued statements of support for the Philippines and criticized China. Professor Lin, what's behind this new push for European concern on maritime security in the region here? The EU, I just mentioned the Indo-Pacific strategy, mainly is maintain the free open in South China Sea. And uh, open free trade is very important for the EU. And uh, now the China use the 10 dash try to claim that they own all the South, South China Sea, which is unacceptable for the EU. And uh, but the thing we need to notice is that the European Union, they don't have military nor navy. So well, they have warships that f but go into that's from belong France to Italy, for example, belong to France, not belong to the EU. So for real, last mm -hmm. last summer they call we should you know send our warship, but actually they don't have that capability, honestly. So but it's still very right political signal to China actually to let China know the EU concern this area, the peace in, the, in this area, the prosperity in the future of South China Sea. And the China must respect international court to say this area not belong to China. I think you mentioned a great point, um, Professor. Um, in terms of maritime security, um, Marcin, how much of this in, is due to Ukraine and due to the Russian invasion of it in terms of being a wake-up call for Europe, given that the South China Sea, or what the Philippines calls as their West Philippine Sea, is so far from Europe geographically. First and foremost, stability in the Indo-Pacific region, and particularly stability in the Taiwan Strait, is one of the foundations of European prosperity. We really see the emergence of the security and prosperity, security and uh, economy nexus in strategic thinking in the thinking within von der Leyen's Geopolitical Commission. And it is an undeniable fact that over 90% of container ships, which are uh, crucial for uh, maintaining global supply chains and keeping them resilient, f uh, go through the Taiwan Strait, transit through the Taiwan Strait. That's why the European Union uh, has to pay attention to the uh, regional developments. I believe that most of European attention and most of European resources are now dedicated to the ongoing um, Russian uh, war of aggression in Ukraine. At the same time, what we need more of in Europe is the conversation about the growing confluence of strategic interests between Beijing and Moscow and China uh, providing aid to Russia, which uh, is detrimental to the Western support pr uh, being provided to Ukraine. So while I don't think that the relationship, uh, that the new opening in the relationship between the EU and the Philippines isn't necessarily conditioned by the uh, situation in Ukraine, we are seeing a growing realization that the 
security and stability of the Euro-Atlantic theater and security and stability of the Indo-Pacific theater are increasingly intertwined. Professor Lin mentioned earlier about how China is behind a lot of these reasons. And Marcin, how much of that do you feel is from China in terms of the EU pivot to the Philippines? And if you want to add something, Professor, please feel free. Sure. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, China uh, and the China policy is one of the most divisive issues in the p process of common foreign and security policy making. Uh, the decision-making process uh, for the common foreign and security policy is guided by the principle of consensus. And it is not easy to foster unity between 27 member states that have very divergent geopolitical realities, divergent economic interests, and also divergent domestic dynamics. For example, uh, becoming closer to Taiwan is unacceptable for member states such as Spain due to their own fears of separatist movements. It is a, a difficult conversation for member states such as Cyprus, uh, which view the so-called Taiwan solution as an ac unacceptable model for managing its own relations with the northern part of the island that has been occupied since 1974. It's, it's extremely difficult to build a European consensus on China, but uh, one direction in which the uh, current uh, Commission President has been pushing um, European external posture is de-risking. And one of the key tools that we can deploy as we try to de-risk uh, our relationship with China or with anybody else is diversification. And this is what Taiwan is trying to achieve with its new South Bank policy. It's all about diversification. It's all about pursuing cooperation whenever possible with the 18 target countries. And that's what the EU is doing with the Indo-Pacific strategy. Not putting all eggs in one basket, exactly. as you say. Now let's talk a bit about the future. Looking at this year's US presidential election, Trump and Biden polls have been neck to neck. If Trump becomes president next year, what implications does this have for Europe? Given Trump's America first approach, could he make Europe become more isolated? Um, Professor Lin, what do you think? Do you feel that there will be a massive change in policy towards the EU if Trump becomes president? Exactly. Now, all the country, all especially European countries, we all nervous and worry about Trump's return. And uh, so we know this, you know, after this election, only two scenarios. One is Trump return or Biden re-elected. So the scenario for Trump return and uh, what will the European do? I think the EU will, you know, there's no choice. First, Trump will finish the Ukraine war, but in what result? And the second, America will leave the NATO and uh, leave the Ukraine, this conflict, this trouble to the EU. So I believe the European Union will more cooperate, cooperation than before under the leadership of Germany and France and the, uh, the other you know, member. And then what happened next? Some, some experts, they worry about maybe after Trump return, the EU will you know, get close with China. And uh, I don't think it's a right assumption because, you know, under the threat from Russia, and uh, we all know, you know, Russia get the chip, get the response from China. So now the European all countries, they are very cautious to work with China. So I don't think even Trump back and then the EU will become best friend of China. What do you think, Marcin? I believe that one of the biggest worries for European stakeholders in case of a Trump 2.0 presidency is trade. Uh, President, uh, former President Trump and presidential hopeful Trump has expressed repeatedly that he is um, hoping to raise tariffs on almost all imports into the United States. And um, despite historically positive uh, transatlantic relations, European countries would not be spared from that. In 2018, when uh, Trump deployed uh, tariffs on many European imports, uh, the EU uh, acted with counter tariffs, but uh, those tariffs in 2018 were more of warning signs. So they covered goods such as bourbon whiskey and peanut butter and uh, emblematic Harley Davidson um, um, motorcycles. I believe that if the tariffs imposed by the Trump 2.0 presidency are more comprehensive, 
Europe would also respond with more comprehensive measures targeting also the most critical American industries, including the aviation industry, including the agricultural industry, and so on. So um, this type of a trade war would not be beneficial to stakeholders on either side of the Atlantic. And another topic that Trump has talked a lot about in the past is NATO. Um, Trump has mentioned that he will punish countries that um, have not paid to their proportion in terms of defense spending of their national budget and also um, lightly or maybe jokingly mention that he would ask Russia to actually attack them in the case that they don't live up to their commitments. What do you think will be the future of NATO, Professor Lin? Can I start with you? It's really hard to say. Some arguments said, see, the world only happened in Biden administration. And uh, when Trump is a president, there is no war, no, you know, the war in Gaza, there is no war in Ukraine. So that's the fault for Biden administration. So if Trump, you know, is a president again, and the, all the arguments he claimed will become true, I do believe the democracy in the United States. And that we will see the parliament will play an important role to monitor, to check Trump's power. So yes, all these concerns we mentioned may be true. And uh, even, even though I still believe the transatlanticism will continue to work together. I wanted to bring us back a little to Taiwan again. Um, Marcin, you're not just a European expert, you're also a Taiwan policy expert. Um, in terms of Taiwan, what do you think the implications would be with the Trump administration? Would that affect, say, Taiwan EU ties and Taiwan US ties? I mean, they've been talking about how you know, Trump would be bad for many countries, but actually he has a team that's very anti-PRC and some would call it very pro-Taiwan. What, what do you say to that? I believe that it's very difficult to read the tea leaves, especially when we're talking about a presidential candidate who is um, as much of a firebrand as, as Mr. Trump is. So I think that uh, one feature of a Trump 2.0 presidency would be his unpredictability. Uh, at the same time, I believe that uh, perhaps somewhat counterintuitively, a Trump 2.0 presidency could be a stabilizing factor in cross-strait relations. And I am saying this because um, I, I don't believe that actors in Zhongnanhai are uh, completely irrational. I think that their actions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan are driven by a very careful calculus. And um, one of the main um, doctrines of the People's Liberation Army is the three warfare doctrine, the doctrine of uh, psychological warfare, public opinion warfare, and lawfare. And the prominence of the three warfares within the PLA strategic thinking tells us that China is trying to gain as much influence over Taiwan as it can without getting its white gloves dirty. And with Trump in the White House, uh, the potential US response would be very difficult to predict. That makes this calculus even more complicated because any escalation in the Taiwan Strait could uh, be met with either complete lack of reaction uh, driven by isolationism and America first thinking or a completely uh, nuclear reaction and um, nuclear quote unquote. So this unpredictability could once again, perhaps counterintuitively, usher in an era of um, more uh, careful and uh, activities in the Taiwan Strait that would very firmly re remain underneath the threshold of kinetic confrontation. You mentioned Zhong Nanhai, but what do you feel in terms of Beijing's position? Would that be advantageous to China with added unpredictability? I believe that uh, Beijing's preferred candidate in this electoral race is uh, President Biden, simply because the aforementioned calculus is easier when you uh, have an easier time predicting your opponent's moves. Professor Lin, I wanted to go back to you in terms of other um, neighbors of Taiwan in the region. We talked about the Philippines and Japan. How would they see a Trump presidency? Do you feel that U.S. allies that share values of democracy, as you mentioned, how the EU values these um, deeply, will they band together more to deal with a U.S. that's a bit more unpredictable? We see the, for example, Japanese Prime Minister, and uh, he went to White, uh, White House to visit Biden and also get to the parliament to give a, a, a speech and uh, make a lot of very good speech. I think they are preparing 
for you know return of Trump, and. Uh, you know, in democracy, we have a, a system. If you sign the agreement, you need to follow. So they do a lot of preparation before Trump, if, if, if anything happened. And we can see this term of, of uh, Japanese government, they already made their mind. They will, you know, become the best friend of the American and uh, share the bundle, especially in the security, in the military, and then they will become a normal country to increase their military budget. And the same as the, the Philippines. So I think every, every, every country, especially Asia country that you mentioned, we are, you know, hurry up to work with American and prepare something happen. Is that also why Marcos Jr. went to the U.S. at the same exactly, time as Kishida? Exactly, yeah, I think so, because it's the best time. And also, for the victory of his, you know, re-elected, Biden do everything for he can win this election. So he used this opportunity. He knows everybody worry about Trump. So it's the best opportunity also for the United States to sign or to, you know, enhance the bilateral relations. Is there anything Taiwan should do better to prepare for a potential Trump 2.0 presidency? Again, I think that diversification is uh, really the name of the game here. It's really important that uh, Taiwan and the new Lai administration um, respects the achievements of the eight years of the new South Wan policy. And I believe that a more comprehensive and uh, cohesive strategy for engagements with Europe would be very beneficial. So um, there is a lot to build upon from the achievements of the new South One policy. And, and I, for one, would very much welcome a new Westbound, a new European policy under the Lai administration. Thank you both for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.